When I think about the word compassion, my mind jumps back into time to when I was a young girl. I grew up with one sister who was four years younger than I. Our parents were educators. My mom quit teaching while pregnant with me and didn't return to her career until I was in high school. While we were growing up, my mom's number one priority was always my sister and me. She put us first and made sacrifices so we could have the best life that a family living on one teacher's salary in the 70s could have. If we needed a dress for a dance, she would make sure we had a new dress. She would either make it herself or get up with us at the crack of dawn to attend the popular early morning sales at the clothing store Dimensions. When it was Halloween one year, while my dad was at work with our only car, Mom decided to take us to get our pumpkins. She gathered up all the change she could find around the house, under couch cushions and my dad's pants pockets, <laughs> and we rode our bikes to the local pumpkin stand. It was an adventure for us and a way for my mom to make sure we got our own pumpkins for the holiday. I have no memory of how that woman got pumpkins home on her bike. <laughs> <laughs> because we were so close to our mother, she told us lots of stories. One particular one has stuck with me for years. When my mom was a young teen, she was going through some angst over a boy. I don't know if he didn't call her when he said he would, or if he went out with someone else, but those details don't really matter. What matters is that when my very upset mother walked into the kitchen and turned to her own mom because she was so sad, my grandmother shrilled, oh, Janet, they're not worth the salt of your tears. <laughs> From the way my mom tells the story, it sounded like my grandmother was dismissive of my mom's feelings and lacked any compassion that the young girl probably needed. The fact that my mother has told that story several times to us just says to me that it was hurtful to her and she never forgot it. My mom once told me that she made a promise to herself many years before we were born. She promised that when she had kids, she would always listen to their feelings and treat them as important no matter what the situation. I can honestly tell you that she has kept that promise. I turned to my mom countless times in tears over one ridiculous teen situation or another and my mother never, ever made me feel like a foolish girl for feeling upset or sad. She made me believe that what I was going through was important to her as well. I'm sure in the back of her mind she was thinking, dear Lord, this is so unimportant. <laughs> but I never felt that way, ever. My mom set a wonderful example for me, and I try my best to let my girls know how important their emotions are too. Over the past couple of years, my mom has been having some substantial memory lapses. She has been tested by doctors, and she has not been diagnosed with dementia or Alzheimer's, thank God. However, it's still difficult to see my mom struggle occasionally when she can't remember an event from her past or a particular word she's looking for. It is clearly my turn to return the compassion to the woman who raised me. I love my mom very much, and she taught me well. I hope I can validate her feelings going forward and let her feel what she should have felt all those years ago in her own mother's kitchen. When I said I would write a reflection for today's service, I had not thought of myself as a compassionate person. More importantly, I was not quite sure how compassion was different from empathy or justice. Every example I thought of related to compassion it seemed like it was a, actually an example of justice. In trying to distinguish between compassion and the concepts of empathy and justice, I googled compassion versus empathy versus justice. It turns out there has been a lot written or said on the subject. Compassion versus empathy. Compassion versus justice. Compassion versus pity, compassion versus tolerance, compassion versus sympathy. A site on compassion versus empathy led me to a video by a mom who, after her daughter came out as gay, was told by her minister, you have to choose either your church or your daughter. She had been active in her church, had many relationships, 
and expected to receive support and compassion. She had gone to her minister and fellow congregants for help and instead heard us or her. She chose her daughter. She now not only supports that daughter, but also tries to take the place of parents who did not choose to take the side of their children. She has sometimes even acted as the parent at a wedding for people she barely knows. My Google search also led me to a TED Talk given by Megan Phelps Roper, who had grown up in Westboro, Westover Baptist Church, the church that protests at soldiers' funerals, the UUA General Assembly, and other places as their form of public witness against homosexuality. They are more egalitarian than that, though. They also carry signs that say things like, I hate Jews. Being young, this woman tweeted her Westboro-inspired beliefs where predictably angry exchanges took place. Somewhere along the way, however, these Twitter, these Twitter battles turned into dialogue and discussion. In some cases, the dialogue became very personal people she had tweeted with would hear that Westboro was coming to protest in their community and would come to talk with her. These conversations led her to leave Westboro. And before she left, her mother, in an effort to keep her following the teachings of the Westboro Church, said to her, you are just human. This was a pivotal moment for Megan because she had come to realize that the people that Westover and her family demonized are all just human too. She left. What happened next? One of the families with whom she had tweeted, a Jewish family, target of the I hate Jews signs she once carried, took her in. She moved into their house. She cooked in their kosher kitchen. She found a new home with a family that understood about compassion. So Twitter connections are not all negative. She also married a man with whom she had once acrimoniously tweeted. In another TED talk, another woman, Dawn Smith, told of being raised in a cult where she, she had to stand on street corners with her family as they preached to passers-by. As a young girl, as she stood on her corner with her preaching family, a woman came up to her, knelt on one knee, looked her in the eye, and said, One day you will grow up and be able to leave all this. After she grew up and left the cult, she saw another young girl with a family of street corner preachers. She walked up to the girl, got down on one knee, looked her in the eye, and said, one day you will grow up and be able to leave all this. That is compassion, not pity, tolerance, or justice, just the raw ability to act on her empathy and be kind. These women, and many others, have told their stories with more humor and forgiveness than I can. But then, these are not my stories. Perhaps my stories are similar, but the one I'm going to tell is not. I grew up in a neighborhood fraught with racism. Once, when I was six or seven, I spent an interminable evening shopping with my mom. Any shopping trip over five minutes seemed interminable, but this one seemed especially long. Finally, we finished. The cashier was bringing up the clothes that my mom had put on the counter when there was a, di when there was a disturbance on the other side of the store. I didn't figure out what was happening, but my mom did. The store owner was harassing a couple of black women for touching clothes. 
for feeling the fabric. <coughs> My mom told the cashier to stop bringing up the clothes. She paid for the items that had been run up, left the rest with the clerk, walked out, and never returned. I was surprised. We had just spent what seemed like hours shopping. I had never seen her just stop like that before, and we were leaving with less than half of our merchandise. I think now my mom chose to leave out of compassion. Part of compassion is a deep awareness of the suffering of others. She does not always have that, but she did that time. Another part is wanting to do something about it. Did the people who ran that store learn anything? Perhaps not, since she did not announce her motivation for leaving, but I learned something. Where does compassion come from? How do some people get so much? Compassion has generated research as well as talks. People with compassion have self-worth. They like themselves, and they like other people, too. Sometimes compassion is modeled. Sometimes our life experiences or the experiences of those we love brings out our compassion. I do have the basic liberal quota of compassion. I have compassion for people fleeing intolerable regimes and circumstances in Honduras, Guatemala, or Syria and for the homeless, the abandoned, and the disenfranchised closer to home. I do not wear a jacket that says, I really don't care. But in the beginning, I said I did not think I was particularly compassionate. Would I take the refugee from the Westboro Baptist Church? Krista Trippett, who spoke at the UUA Assembly in 2016, has said, compassion is being kind, being curious, and seeing beauty. Compassion, Tippett says, is linked to forgiveness, generosity, and hospitality. It requires being present. It is physical. It requires not only strategies and statistics. Compassion needs stories. So perhaps I am somewhat wrong about myself, for I am ready to listen and to learn from those stories. Isn't that what we strive for in church, at home, and other places? Compassion builds community. Be kind, be curious, be present, see beauty, and tell your stories. For a number of years, I took courses from an adult educational organization. In preparation for each course, there was a form to fill out that included the question, what do you intend to get out of this course? I regularly replied that I wanted to become more compassionate. What I meant by that was I wanted to be able to be in the presence of others without constantly judging them while at the same time fearing that they were judging me. And I suppose that in small increments over the years, I have become a more compassionate person, but I am still well aware of my failings. I struggle in this whole domain. With much practice, I have learned to be present and just listen to someone who is suffering or in pain. I have learned to suppress my natural tendency to fix them or their situation, and I've learned to just be there for them. It's not easy. I often forget that that is all I really have to offer them, a listener. When I am able to listen from the place of having no judgments, no opinions, no good advice, now thinking I know what is best for them, when I can do that, something remarkable begins to happen, and the deep connection between us begins to reveal itself. It also begins a slow process of healing the suffering that is present. The struggle with that aspect of compassion is an internal one, where I have to let go of trying to be wise, smart, helpful, knowing the answers, or wanting to be liked, so that I can really focus on the other person with empathy and kindness. I have to be able to feel their pain without succumbing to it myself. I have to be able to take it in without holding on to it. Difficult though it is, that is the easy part compared to the other area of my struggle. Of everything else of value in being a Unitarian Universalist, the most significant to me is our first principle. 
the inherent worth and dignity of every person. Too often, I find that it is much easier to live true to this principle when I am among like-minded people. It is much more difficult to know how to live a compassionate life in a world that is divided by lies, alternative facts, strong opinions that seem to be based on emotion rather than fact, and deep anger toward the other. In these challenging times, I am not certain how to balance justice with compassion, empathy with appropriate limits, telling the truth to power with kindness. I am still very reactive when it comes to the political arena. I think the call to all of us to expand our capacities for both compassion and social justice actions is growing louder and louder. I just want to act without anger or fear to speak to the possibilities of a better functioning country and world in a manner that can be heard by all. I belong to a knitting circle in my community that includes several very outspoken conservative women. I don't understand why they think the way they do or why they have such great fears that immigrants or Muslims will ruin our country rather than making it stronger. Yet we love one another and can sit for hours together knitting. I have known these women for many years. It has been easier to be silent and let them talk, while in the privacy of my own mind, I judge them rather than engage. They know I am the lone liberal among them and sometimes ask me very pointed questions. I know that if I respond to what they say by telling them they are wrong, we will never get anywhere. Recently though, I've begun to be able to experience curiosity rather than rash judgment about them. I think I'm ready to act rather and see if we can together create an opportunity to share what is in our hearts. It seems to me that only when I can succeed at this kind of challenge that is close to home will I be able to be really effective in the larger world. These words of Martin Luther King Jr. provide some guidance. He says, compassion and nonviolence help us to see the enemy's point of view, to hear their questions, to know their assessment of ourselves. Far from their, for from their point of view, we may indeed see the basic weaknesses of our own condition. And if we are mature, we may learn and grow and profit from the wisdom of the brothers and sisters who are called the opposition. It is good that we are all here together. There is much to learn and much work to be done. <laughs>